Welcome to the Doctor's Kitchen with me, Dr. Rupi. I've got Eddie Stern in the kitchen today, who is a world-renowned yoga teacher. He's written an incredible book, One Simple Thing, and it's an amazing introduction into the science of yoga, as well as the basics of Ashtanga yoga, which is his chosen practice. We have a wonderful conversation in the kitchen. I make for him an incredibly simple dish. It's broccoli, beans with some onion seeds, and I serve it with some purple potatoes and some wild rice as well. Very easy, he likes it simple. You're gonna love this episode and check out the podcast as well, the link is below. One night, my teacher's wife said to this woman, what are you cooking for dinner? And she said, I'm cooking mushrooms. She said, oh no, we don't eat mushrooms. Um, they're not vegetarian. What are you talking about? Of course mushrooms are vegetarian, they're a vegetable. And my teacher's wife said, no, they're one type of fish. And we had never heard that before. So with a little bit of research and looking around, it seemed that mushrooms, which are a fungus, do share some genetic material with the fish family. So the South Indian Brahmins, typically they don't eat mushrooms, but they were very adamant that mushroom is from the fish family. Some mushrooms are carnivorous as well, like uh, cordyceps are carnivorous. I've heard of yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you can go on YouTube and see how a cordyceps will eat an ant. It, they go inside their body and explode their heads. Wow. Yeah, it's quite something. Inside, the fungus is growing, feeding on the fly's fat, and infiltrating its mind. So I haven't eaten mushrooms since then. Hey, don't mess with me, man. Yeah, okay, whatever. They also are one of the oldest organisms on the planet. Their roots go extremely deep through the earth, and they actually act as like the nervous system of the planet, how they connect and communicate with each other. I was going to tell you something. By the way, this is the mistake I've been making. I've been getting th that same broccoli from the farmer's market, cutting it up, but putting it all in at the same time. Ah, yeah. And I notice this, this difference in texture yeah. between the florets and the stems, and yeah. I guess I'm just a little bit of a lazy cook. So. Yeah. Before I started doing yoga, I became a vegetarian. That was my first step on a spiritual path. I was living a very unhealthy life and I met a guy who did yoga, he's a vegetarian, his name was Ted. And he told me about vegetarian diet and I thought this sounds great. So the next day I became a vegetarian. I stopped eating Big Macs and McDonald's and Burger King and pizza and falafels and well, falafels vegetarian. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I didn't know what to eat. So basically I ate iceberg red lettuce rice cakes and apples for like about about a month maybe a little less and pasta yeah. uh, until i figured out how to start cooking some stuff and i bought a cookbook called the macrobiotic way by michio kushi mm -hmm. and in that he had these 10 exercises that were basically yoga poses that i started doing so that was the first introduction i had to doing something with my body other than skateboarding and slam dancing and i didn't even know i was doing yoga poses so i started with food yeah, in yoga they say that the mind and body are a continuum. There is no distinction between the two. And you know as a doctor seeing people, when their body has illness in it, something happens at the same time to their mind. Maybe they get depressed, mm. they get sad, they feel defeated. But when health comes back to the body, automatically they become happier. So yoga says what you do to your body, you do to your mind. And meditation says what you do to your mind, you do to your body. Mm. And um, yoga is both you know, movement and meditation. It's both yeah. of those things at the same time. From a neurological perspective, we have bottom-up processing, information processing, where we do things that affect the brainstem, like breathing, regulated breathing, regulated posture, and those are gonna work their way up through the limbic system, through emotional processing, fear and memory, up to the cortical regions where we interrelate with people socially. From the asana perspective and breathing perspective, this is bottom up information processing. And then from a meditative perspective, we do something on the cortical regions, we practice compassion and empathy and open monitoring of awareness. All these affect the prefrontal cortex. That sends messages down through the limbic system. Everything is okay, you're safe, so fear subsides. And then that affects your heart rate your blood pressure, lowers inflammation, and all these types of things. Mm -hmm. 
What I've noticed and one of the things I wrote about in the book was that you, if you grab anybody off the street, grab 10 people off the street and say, do you do yoga? And they say to you, yes. And you say, how does it make you feel? They say, I feel more grounded, more connected to myself, more flexible, a little more calm. My breathing is better. My sleep is better. My digestion is improved. Um, all of those things, I feel happier. I have less anger. Those are the general reports that everyone will say who does yoga. And then you say to them, well, what kind of yoga do you do? And someone will say, I do Iyengar, I do Ashtanga, I do Kundalini, I do Shivananda, I do Integral. And they'll name a bunch of different yogas. And then you'll think, well, how is it that all of these different types of yoga, which are applying different ways of doing the practices, are giving the same outcomes? It doesn't matter like what kind of breathing you do, really, it just has to work for you. Yeah. Or what kind of posture you do, it just has to work for you. And then it's going to work on your same nervous system that I happen to have also. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some people are going to like real standing poses and some people are going to like inverted poses, but the same thing is happening. It's affecting the homeostatic capabilities of the nervous system, which is to restore balance. Mm -hmm. And so we need to work to support the restoration of balance in us through basic things, eating good food, getting enough sleep, exercising, having some quiet moments of reflection, and having friends yeah. and family and social connection. Uh, do you want to give it a try? Yeah, definitely. Cool. Has everyone seen that your rice bowl says rupee on it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if they haven't, they should see this. So yeah, yeah. That's I, what, I, what, did your mom give this to you or something? <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> if you want to listen to the rest of our podcast, just click on the link down below and we will see you there. Thank you so much for watching this video. There's so many others for you to enjoy right here. Check out the doctorskitchen.com, sign up to the newsletter where I give science-based recipes every single week. There's a podcast, there's two books, there's loads more content on social media, doctors underscore kitchen, and I hope to see you there.